So Africa is really significant at the moment. Um, uh, uh, one in uh, every eight people on the continent is African. By the end of the century, one in four. So 25% of the global population by the end of the century will be African. So this is significant. And why it's significant, it's the only world region that will continue to have a pretty robust demographic profile, speak of the devil, um, robust profile uh, right up until the end of the century. Uh, we expect Asia to plateau around uh, 2070, 2080. Um, now... Of course, what this means is that um, we are seeing a, the beginnings of this robust demographic increase. And of course, within that, it is not just urban areas that is growing, but it is also rural areas, right? So both shares are increasing dramatically. And of course, we expect around 2035 for the share of the urban population to overtake the share of the rural population. But it is very, very important to recognize that we have growth in both categories of settlements, not just urban. And you cannot understand urban in Africa without engaging in a deep way with the interconnectedness and the interdependencies between rural and urban. And the peri-urban zones that serve as this interface between these artificial categories of, of definition uh, is really where, where some of the most complex and difficult questions reside. Now, even though we might in some ways be seen to still be on in the start of this journey, in truth, of course, Africa is already profoundly urban, not just in terms of the fact that there are as many million-plus cities in Africa as there is in Europe, but culturally speaking, uh, modern capitalist consumerism reaches into every nook and cranny of the continent, whether you're in urban or rural areas. It is a profoundly culturally urban place. And, of course... It is an absurdity to speak about the continent as a singularity, right? So we do this all the time. It is a default, um, and it is necessary to be able to have a conversation. But if you just look at the different rates of levels of urbanization from East Africa to Southern Africa, North Africa, you have urban worlds within urban worlds within this uh, continent. Um, so it, it is simply problematic to suggest that we can speak of an urbanity that is African. It's, it doesn't exist. But we have this conversation as a shorthand because what marks all of these contexts is that we are singularly unprepared to understand and manage this context, whether we are predominantly urban or still in the early days, as is the case in East Africa. Now, what is unique about the singularity that is Africa is that in most parts of the world, this is a very typical correlation that economists will show you. That the more uh, GDP growth takes off, it is broadly correlated with increasing levels of urbanization. And the data for most world regions absolutely bears this out, <laughs> whether it's in Asia, Latin America, Europe, or, or North America. However, if you look at Africa over this period of 1985 to 2012, you have a completely atypical manifestation, right? The correlations don't exist in the same way. Um, of course, the reasons why you can have reversals, as in the case of Liberia or Cameroon or Madagascar or Zimbabwe, uh, of course, uh, often boils down to questions of violence, war, corruption, bad governance, and a whole series of other uh, um, uh, issues that, that, that most of you would be familiar with. Now, the other point that you may have noticed from these two graphs um, is, is the scales, right? So um, we're talking about a very different scale when we look at Latin America in terms of your GDP per capita numbers than to Africa. Right? Now, this is very important because I'll come back to this, because at the heart of the question about how do we respond and what are the imaginaries that is driving our responses is the need to confront large-scale poverty and very, very, very low incomes, which circumscribes the realm of the possible in terms of, if you will, uh, intentional development interventions, right? Because we've got to always think about questions of appropriateness and cost. Um, and, and in this sense, again, we're talking about a very, very different environment. Now, again, much of what is on the table in terms of proposals, I would argue, doesn't quite understand 
the longitudinal dynamic of large-scale economic stagnation and decline in many parts of the continent, and also Africa's relative marginality in relation to the rest of the global economy. Now, as Africans, we've got to be ruthlessly realistic about what our location is in the world, how do we fit into things if we are going to engage in this globalized game of thinking about what constitutes appropriate interventions. Now, this is important not just to understand Africa's relative position, this is OECD data, by the way, but also to understand, again, uh, this question about relative wealth. So if you take the five regions of Africa, this is based on the International Futures Forecasting Methodology, and this already factors in uh, uh, the sort of relatively high growth rates of the, of the, of the 2000 to 2010 uh, period. What you will see is that the three populous regions of the continent that will experience most of the demographic growth over the next 40 years will, by the end, by the middle of the century, still have GDP per capita numbers uh, below $4,000. Okay. So despite the fact that populations will increase by threefold, you will still have, on aggregate level, very, very poor populations in very large numbers. To illustrate this from more recent data that was just generated um, for a forthcoming report of the Africa Progress Panel, you will see that if you take a uh, look at current levels of GDP per capita um, in Africa's 10 poorest cities, that on the back of fairly optimistic growth scenarios for, for the next 15 years, you're looking at more or less a doubling, but still for some of these key cities with over 10 million people, you're talking about numbers below $500, still $600 per capita. Now that's important because you can't do almost any major network bulk infrastructure investment if your population is that poor. You just don't have the financial basis, right? So, so these numbers, they of course have all the limitations that econ econometric numbers have, but they help us to understand size and shape. And this is very, very important in relation to this question that Michelle proposed this morning in terms of the appropriateness of certain models that are being parachuted in and deployed in the African context. Now, of course, um, uh, it is true that Africa is changing. The last decade and a half, we've seen a radical shift in the levels of economic development relative to the three decades before where you saw pretty modest economic growth numbers of a very, very low basis, right? And if you look at particularly the last decade and a half, um, you will see that this yellow line is the, uh, is the um, sub-Saharan African line, and this shows you uh, GDP growth numbers uh, of some key African countries relative to the, in, in the top 20, and there are lots of African countries in that. But again, bear in mind, of a very, very low base, and we will come to a related question, which is the distribution of income. So one of the puzzles that I'm still looking for an economist to explain to me is that despite relatively, in, in, in macroeconomic terms, low levels of development, in other words, hardly any industrial base, uh, hardly any uh, sort of large-scale working-class industrial absorption of the labor force, Despite the absence of that, you already have a Gini coefficient, an income inequality number, above 0 0.5, similar to Latin America. Now, that is just bizarre, right? Because if you've got very, very high income inequality levels, what that means is that the distribution of all of this future growth that we're talking about is already highly skewed. And very large proportions of uh, the population won't necessarily benefit from that. And you can see it very clearly in this distribution graph. So what this does is it compares the proportion of the populations below the, these two income poverty metrics. And it compares it with China and India. And as you would expect, China's curve looks differently. And it's been able to lift a relatively large, and we, as we've heard the numbers, something like half a billion people out of poverty over the last 20 years, right? And you can see it in that distribution. India is taking off. Uh, in terms of this distribution curve, that represents a good two, 300 million people, okay? Africa, of course, is a smaller population, but as you can see, the vast bulk of the population is still below $500. 
the $1 poverty line. And the question is, as it goes through this demographic transition over the next 20 years, will we see this distribution shift this way? Or can we anticipate that it will more or less remain uh, as it is at the moment, right? So these are some of the big questions. And this is just to drive that point home. Data from the African Development Bank in 2011 shows that 81% of African subsist on less than uh, $4 a day, okay? So part of why this is the case um, relates to the structure of the labor market in Africa. So this is data that was compiled by the ILO and uh, the McKinsey Global Institute. And what they show is that the vast bulk of the labor force in Africa is in a category called vulnerable employment. So what is this? And it is so central to the overall argument, it's worth to re reading the definition. It includes subsistence farming, informal self-employment, and work for family members. And this is where the vast majority is. Now, remember the earlier graph. We've seen this incredibly positive impact of growth in Africa the last decade. Average growth numbers are around 6%. Despite that growth, we've seen only a 2% drop in the proportion of the labor force that is in this category of vulnerable employment, which speaks back into the question of the Gini coefficient, right? So there is no automatic translation of GDP growth into decent employment. There's a labor market mismatch in terms of how Africa's economy and demographic transition intersects. Now, the combination of limited decent employment, low incomes, and also long-term limited infrastructure investment has, of course, manifested in large-scale slum urbanism in Africa. So if you look at the distribution of the proportion of households in sub-Saharan Africa, in, uh, sorry, the, the map of the world is bled out in the slide, uh, so, that, so um, uh, imagine there's a map of the world. Um, you will see that it is significantly higher than any of the other Asian regions that you'd expect very high levels of informality as well. Of course, again, the proportions of the populations here are much greater. So in absolute numbers, there are more people living in slums in Asia than in Africa. But this proportion is really significant, 62% of the population. So on the back of these large-scale post-colonial trends that, if you will, structure the political economy of opportunity of Africa, what we've seen emerging as urbanization has unfolded is a logic of urbanization that is slum-producing, or uh, what Ananya Roy would argue is a informal reproducing logic of the city. And it's kind of obvious, right, if you think a little bit about it. The economy is inverted. Most economic transactions and incomes are in the informal domain. It means that most households have very low and very erratic incomes. So that structures how you organize your livelihood opportunities and how you manifest yourself. For states, it means that you've got an incredibly low tax base to draw on. So you can't undertake, or in principle, you shouldn't undertake expensive CapEx investments. And you've got, obviously, both from the public and the private sectors, too little money to deal with the extent of the need. And then the political economy of decision-making kicks in, right? So you've got vast need, and you've got political allocation systems that are skewed. And that's a very complicated story in itself, which I don't have time to get into, uh, but take my word for it that politics in Africa isn't um, a neat uh, uh, process of rational allocation of resources. We can come back to that. And of course, uh, the cycle reproduces itself. Now, the most important driver of this is that half of Africa's population is younger than 19 years of age. Okay, half. And remember the earlier distribution of the demographic uh, transition that I showed you up to the end of the century? So that explains some of that. In 35 years' time, this is what we expect uh, the population pyramid to look like. What that means is that over the next 30, 35 years, we're expecting the labor force to treble, to go from 400 million to 1.2 billion. 
Now, please keep this in mind in relation to the earlier data that I showed you that 63% of the labor force is in this category of vulnerable employment. So, if these proportions don't change substantially, slum urbanism will remain the dominant mode of urbanization for Africa for the foreseeable future, right? So, Michelle's question has to be understood in relation to that, that fact. So, how do we think of this hybrid model of urbanization that can both work with and understand the drivers of private real estate, but really begin to think about the scale and the significance of the largest majority of the continent's population uh, that, that sits in, in that domain. So for public policy um, uh, sort of experts and people are interested in that, what is worrying about this is compound risk. Right? So if all things are equal, as I've discussed them to now, and we anticipate most of these trends to continue into the future, what we will see, as we've already seen in many places, is an agglomeration of multiple negative dynamics. Right? So uh, the, the sort of recent uptake of this idea of agglomeration economics in the 2009 World Bank report that has made uh, urban agglomeration sexy again suggests that there's this potential of virtuous uh, connections between the demographic transition, uh, the concentration of a multiplicity of economic actors and so forth in urban areas, and that that gives you a certain dynamism. Uh, I think we're contending with a very, very different set of dynamics in, in, in the African continent. And of course, the implication of this is that the inability to generate sufficient wage-earning jobs um, means that most households in Africa will be unable to afford living in a formal house, pay taxes, or contest the rules of the game when it comes to formal politics. Right? So how do we begin to think about a context where this is the norm, because this essentially wipes away all of the starting points of the conventional ways in which we think about urban planning, or we think about urban governance, or we think about urban management, right? You've got an elected local authority, you've got organized civil society interests that aggregate their interest, they contest informal politics, they've got clear bargaining power, and there are clear rules of the game that help you to contest priorities in society that then informs the allocation of scarce resources. None of that exists in most of these places. So where does that leave us? How do we think about the polity and how do we think about civil society and how do we think about the aggregation and the contestation of public and social interests to begin to both fathom these issues and work our way through? It is not as if this problem is, is not confronting decision makers and powerful actors in, in a variety of institutional settings. Um, this year is very significant. In September, in the, U, uh, uh, the UN will gather heads of states from uh, all the member countries, and we will be negotiating on behalf of the global population uh, what constitutes the good society and the minimum material expression of uh, the covenant of human rights uh, 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 measured by a certain target set for 2030, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. And within this process, what has been really significant is that cities has emerged as a key star actor in the discourse. With the Millennium Development Goals of 2000, cities were absent. And by the way, the economy was absent. It was essentially a poverty reduction debate and discussion with a very strong focus on health and education and so on. This time around, it is different. Uh, there's an acknowledgement that the draft, 17 draft goals, if you will, come together in space in urban areas and that the battle for sustainable development will be won or lost in how we think about cities. Um, one of the, uh, the thematic groups feeding into this process argues that the success of the SDGs will be determined to a large extent in the world cities, which lie at the fulcrum, and look at this, this list, employment creation, eradication of extreme poverty, 
inclusive economic growth, and environmental sustainability. So contrast that with the conclusion earlier in terms of the set of conditions, uh, in fact, that we've got to come to terms with. And um, uh, Rohir, I'm going to be a little bit... Uh, um, uh, uh, either very uh, politically correct, quoting your boss, um, or um, and 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 uh, and also uh, 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 suggest that we we question this. In a recent piece uh, that the head of UN Habitat um, published uh, in the LSE Cities newspaper at the end of last year, he argues the following, and in some ways this is the most succinct and the crisp and and clearest articulation of what one could argue the global development industry is suggesting is the way forward to deal with some of the challenges that I've mentioned. And it is worth reading the quote at length. Good cities do not come about by accident. The prerequisites for a good city are broad community consensus, no argument there, long-standing political determination, and sound urban planning, which over the course of time engender urban environments that can provide well-being, the security to the inhabitants, guarantee the supply of water, energy, and food, and promote a compact and diverse urban structure in which innovation, trade, and economic prosperity are encouraged. It definitely protects urban communal space in which individual rights and opportunities are respected. Results like these have never been achieved through spontaneous urbanization, nor by the adoption of wrong-sighted decisions. I love that last part. Uh, a wrong-sighted decision. It'd be great if you could be the arbiter of who makes wrong-sighted decisions, but anyway. Um, so many, many key words in here. I won't go into an extensive discourse analysis on this, but the point is that there's a very clear idea that if you can get the institutions right, you can sort out planning, you can begin to get a handle on this informed by a normative interest in human rights and the public sphere. Okay? That's, that's the debate. Nothing to argue with there. My heart really feels very warm at the moment just saying these words. So very, very important. The question is, is this sufficient to simply invoke a normative feel-good disposition in the context of the real-world city, if you will, the real-world African city, and where it's heading? Is this good enough to invoke a normative horizon? Or is there something else that we need to be grappling with to bridge the chasm between this intent and what we know is unfolding on the ground, right? And this is the provocation that I'm throwing out today uh, for, for us to, to be thinking about. On the other end, you have the private sector feverishly working to, if you will, extend its hegemony in thinking about what does the urban mean, and how do we frame the urban as an opportunity, and what does that then translate into, into a hierarchy of investments and how cities should be managed in Africa. There's been a series of reports that by far the most prodigious, of course, has been the McKinsey Global Institute. They've done amazing work on Africa. They've done India. They've done China. They've done the world. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, the moon and Mars is next on the agenda. Um, but, you know, if there is an urban economy to be mapped and graphed and uh, put into a consulting frame, McKinsey's on the job. Uh, there was a really interesting report also now a good five years ago by Monitor with some local Joburg-based partners called Africa from the Bottom Up, trying to engage with this question of informality and so on. We know that when the World Economic Forum uh, convenes the great and the good, uh, that underlying that now for the last five, six years is also an annual report looking at cities around the world. And they've recently turned their attention, this is the most recent one, uh, also to a study in Africa. Uh, MasterCard has been producing now for the last three years the Africa Cities Growth Index, again providing another kind of framing. And literally a month ago, uh, PwC produced this report uh, into Africa, the continent's cities of opportunity. Now, these are, are, are very, very significant because I can promise you when African scholars and activists and writers said that the urban matters for development, African heads of state and governments weren't particularly interested, um, but when the private sector says so, it helps all of us to move the agenda up on, 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 on the horizon. 
But two quotes will suffice to say what is the imaginary at play with regard to these think tanks who are incredibly influential and powerful with decision makers. From this report, getting the basics right, stable and prudent macroeconomic policies, efficient and simple taxation, a flexible labor market, openness to trade in foreign direct investment, simple and transparent domestic business regulation, a safety net that protects the most vulnerable, these are the primary lessons for good public policy. Right? Of course it is, right? Nothing to argue with there. Of course, how you protect the vulnerable if your participation in this game means that you remain systemically at the margins of the global economy, as much of sub-Saharan Africa is, of course, is never explained in the report. Um, But, you know, um, you've got to sort that out, and then you'll figure that out, of course, as you go along. From this report... (laughs) But now the consensus appears to be turning to a new reality, namely of an Africa laying down solid economic roots beyond economies based exclusively on commodities and establishing a momentum of growth driven by, and this is my favorite bit, a strong middle class. Now, this is really important because a lot of this narrative turns on the promise of the middle class. A lot of what is driving the speculative bubble around the new towns that Michelle was referencing to is this anticipation of this emergence of this middle class. A lot of what sits behind that in turn is a sleight of hand where it was suggested that if you count the middle class as all households with incomes above $4, that in fact you've got a robust middle class, whereas of course the globally calibrated definition that the OECD promotes suggests that $10 $10 per day is kind of the minimum bottom end threshold for what constitutes middle class uh, globally. If you do that, then Africa's middle class shrinks dramatically, and very few of the business cases around these new towns and around the associated investments in terms of a whole bunch of things, of course, uh, uh, evaporates very, very quickly. So if we look out across these various debates and processes over the last while. What seems very clear, please, um, is, uh, is that we kind of dealing, the, the African urban story is emerging at a time where cities as part of a larger discursive bubble, right? So everyone somehow thinks at the moment that if you get the cities right, you in a way get a whole bunch of economic recovery questions post-2008 and a whole bunch of development policy questions right. It all comes together in the city. And um, I think it is a bubble. And it is important that we don't, if you you will, of course we all sit here today, so we're part of this bubble, but that we in a way use it to really open up and drive a very different uh, debate. So my problem with these, without going into too much detail, is that there's very little institutional or political capacity to confront the systemic drivers of dysfunctional and unjust urbanism. The private sector fixates on an elusive middle class, and the development industry obsesses with getting planning and decentralization right. Hardly anyone is coming to terms with the real emergent African city that is being built by Africans themselves. In some ways, this quote by Teddy Cruz captures what the provocation is about. And a couple of years he argued that the informal is not just an image of precariousness, it is a compendium of practices, a set of functional urban operations that count and transgress imposed political boundaries and hierarchic economic models. The hidden urban operations of the most compelling cases of informal urbanization need to be translated into a new political language with particular spatial consequences. This will lead to new interpretations of housing, infrastructure, property, and citizenship, and inspire new modes of intervention in the contemporary city. Now, I'm a huge fan of Teddy's work and thought, but I do think that there's a problem with assuming that the informal has all the solutions. I think the informal is, and this is how I interpret his provocation, is a necessary passageway through which we have to think but in and of itself, survival and, if you will, uh, the, 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 the makeshift city in and of itself will not 
resolve these questions. And I suppose it goes back to the earlier provocation about questions of scale. And so shifting registers and thinking a little bit proactively and trying to formulate a debate as Africans about how do we open up, uh, how do we think through these, these problematics. I think there's a couple of um, touch points. One, target the money. Right. We've got to understand the game and we've got to contest the hustle. Right. Capitalism is a hustle. Right. That's what it is. So you've got to get in there and you've got to understand the way in which it has embedded itself social, culturally, within this very unique post-colonial setting uh, that makes for post-colonial Africa. You've got to recast, in quite precise terms, I would argue, the imaginary that drives the de facto investment portfolio. We've got to figure out how do we insinuate and reinforce an alternative imaginary with compelling experiments linked into theory building and compelling discursive repertoires. So we've got to do it all together. That's the game. You've got to show different ways. You've got to, if you will, reframe that theoretically, critique the canon, and you've got to figure out how to translate that into compelling narratives that has political and cultural resonance. We've got to do it all, and we've got to figure out how to do it simultaneously, and that, for me, is at the heart of what this searching is that we are all engaged in. But of course, it does mean that we've got to think about these things as fundamentally epistemic struggles, right? Going back to the question of language, going back to the fundamentals of theory building, we've got to excavate and we've got to build a new, new languages. This is a massive global epistemic project. Now, going back to the hustle, this is where the money's at, right? It's infrastructure. So everyone across all sectors would agree that infrastructure deficits represents real and growing threat to sustained growth on the continent. So that's the meeting point. So let's work with it. The problem is, and again, my map has disappeared. Um, if you look at Africa's infrastructure deficit, the last calculation done by the World Bank around 2010 puts it at about 45 billion per annum. But because you guys have set very stringent rules in terms of environmental efficiency, your deficit is three times the, the, the size, right? And massively in Europe. So the whole world is rebuilding itself. The problem, of course, is that your economies are flatlined and the growth is happening here, and that is reorienting the global infrastructure business, right? And, of course, uh, as architects and designers, you feed off the teats of infrastructure investments, right? So this is really important, these numbers, uh, their impact on all of us. So this is the provocation. How do we recast urban infrastructure investment plans, right? Very dry stuff, so that we, they are based on a realization that new systems can allow for creative destruction, okay? So the consultancy term is leapfrogging. I love the old Schumpeterian idea of creative destruction, right? That seems to be the business we, we should be into. into. Um, and I think we're pretty clear with very poor populations and with, at the moment in Africa, very low levels of waste and outside of South Africa uh, emissions, the, the challenge is, is to s retain that while you deal with access. Right, in a way that allows for an affordable reproductive context for households. So if you will, as designers, we've got the brief. Simple, right? It's got to just be all of that stuff together and it's got to make financial sense. The brief is there, okay? What we've got to do is, um, how, does that, uh, um, how does that become a, a reality at, in different institutional contexts and scale? So... Of course, as Michelle has elaborated and, and Inti is doing this amazing work to demonstrate that this is what the current investment uh, agenda is giving us, slum neglect. Uh, if we take Makoko, um, and of course, uh, Eco Atlantic is, is our favorite target at the moment because they had the audacity to get Bill Clinton to uh, anoint uh, the investment, um, you know, so, and they've got the coolest pictures, you must admit. Um, so I love that. I don't know what the hell that is. It's like a spaceship that is landed sideways. It's like a scene from, um, 
what's that movie? Uh, uh, Men in Black 2. The, um, is that fantastic creature with that spaceship in the back of his van, right? This looks like one of that. Um, so, so, so at a macro level, we kind of know what the normative horizon is, right? And this is the sustainable development uh, um, uh, goals discussion in September, is how do you square this impossible uh, formula, right? You want to get everyone, human developments up, education, health, social welfare, you want to have job intensive growth, and you, of course, want a growth model that is resource efficient so that we can wean off non-renewable resources and we stop pumping in uh, 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 all of the stuff that uh, this wonderful city of Rotterdam, uh, Martin Heyer tells me 80% of Rotterdam's harbors uh, energy uh, is of uh, fossil fuels. So, you know, kind of got to figure out how to, to crack that. So, so this is clear. We kind of know the, the broader picture and we know that urban is there. The intellectual and the design challenge for Africans is this, I would argue, is that there are really just two critical imperatives. Got to deal with essential basic services for all. And this is the typical South African city. You've got relatively high access, but on the carbon side, we're doing terribly because 95% of our energy uh, mix in South Africa is coal, right? So, so we're doing really badly. We've got a higher per capita emission rate than uh, typical European societies. And this is the trajectory, right? So what are the precise trade-offs and opportunities that need to be understood and mapped over the medium to long term to create the framing context for understanding what specific projects and interventions need to do in the next five or ten years, right? That's the question. And surely between all of us and our networks on the continent and so on, we can begin to aggregate the knowledge, and this will be the last part of my talk, um, as how do we create that base to aggregate that knowledge? This is the typical sub-Saharan African city. Doing very well on the carbon side, but doing terribly on the basic services side, right? So completely different story to South Africa, but all, more or less, we all have the fa same set of questions to figure out. Right at a macro level. So within this, in thinking through what one could call designing specific pathways for different cities, different national contexts, and so on, the knowledge we need to aggregate is fairly clear. We've got to understand what does it mean? What is this infrastructure requirement? How do we think about that investment in relation to urban form? How do we deal with the right space agenda of universal access to basic services? And is there a way in which infrastructure investment cannot simply be about dealing with basic needs, but about activating economies across the full spectrum of the economy, right? Formal, informal, non-formal, um, and so on. Now, to conclude then, if we are going to build this shared epistemic project, this epistemic frame, we need data. We need to know what the hell is going on. And so much of what we do is at an aggregate level that we don't really have a clue what is actually happening in specific places on the continent, right? So this is a bit of, a, of an attempt to map, and again, I've got a bleeding out problem, but um, there's, a, there, there, there's a whole series of things that we need to come to terms with for all cities, right? This is that infrastructure point I just made. But we can begin to have comparative discussions by understanding the nature of, of urban metabolic systems, and I understand the last Rotterdam Biennale had a fantastic exposition of what metabolic dynamics look like in the Netherlands. Um, so you've got all got an amazing visual idea of what that could be. And then, of course, this is the bread and butter of most people in this audience. But what we still have a very poor handle on is not just the question of need, but actually desire, right? So we really, really have to come to terms with issues of demand and aspiration because there is a massive disconnect with how people think about basic needs and what ordinary Africans desire and how that shapes the way in which they insert themselves into the world and into cities, what their consumption preferences are. And we've got to, got to, got to get a handle on some of that. And of course, 
that requires understanding what is emerging as opposed to our projection of what a household who lives on $2 a day may need or want and so forth, right? Because I promise you what you think it is and what they do are two completely different things. And we do live in this amazing, amazing time in which disruptive technologies are a fact of life and they will become increasingly important. So there's a vital debate for us all to engage in is about what are appropriate technological intermediations for these dynamics, right? So what is often left out of what could potentially be a very technocratic discussion is the question of governance and institutions, right? So all of these processes, if we can begin to map them out. So think, imagine we've got this kind of map for every town, every city across the continent, and we can then begin to really have the comparative, the rich uh, discussions. Um, just another way, I'll skip this. Um, this is just another way of indicating what this research agenda is. If you take your network infrastructure systems, you take your socioeconomic infrastructure systems, you kind of need to build this kind of empirical picture for all places, right? At the moment, we're kind of nowhere on these things, even well-endowed cities like Johannesburg with a, a bunch of universities, a bunch of urban scholars. We don't really have this data at the level of granularity that we need it to begin to have the sufficiency, the depth of knowledge to be able to understand where the intervention points are uh, for innovation, which points to the fact that we need different ways of both generating the knowledge but also opening up the public conversation. So this is just a way of trying to argue that we need to not just produce the knowledge but we also need to provoke the publics for the knowledge to be debated and discussed. And this is one provocation, right? That these are kind of the kind of four ways that we can go in terms of these trajectories that I was talking about. That's what we have now. That's maybe what we'll get if we're lucky that a developer wants to do a green-gated community. This is what some of the big corporates are pushing for, is prioritize fiber, prioritize the backbone for smart city infrastructure, but also do mobility and so on. And this is uh, you know, what I would argue for is, is what we need. Best case scenario, we all make a lot of noise, we do fantastic projects, we get great critical mass. This will be, by 2050, the distribution of effort. Right? This is what we need. Sorry, the, the projector is very, very powerful, so it's bleeding out all the subtlety of the presentation. Anyway, story of my life. Um, so this is kind of uh, uh, what we need. And in a way, what we've got to understand is, you know, progressive private public interest. This is where we could possibly draw them to into a conversation. This is what we need, I think, given what I've said earlier. And this is really the epistemic space where we need to play. And for me, where if we think step back and we really think through the, the, the different kinds of research and knowledge production that is required, um, that, that it can f hinge itself onto that articulation between the debate. So I wanted to kind of make a whole story about how the Density Syndicate was a wonderful experiment for me in figuring out uh, what some of this um, uh, innovation hothouse process could be. And uh, just to conclude then and say that um, within that broader frame that I cannot overemphasize enough the importance of the kind of collaboration that we entered into with INTI and the, the partners in the Netherlands and in Cape Town last year, where through the Density Syndicate, where we were able to not just do real grounded research that was trying to understand context in its, on its own terms, but to also invoke a symbolic imaginary that can create the context for a completely different discussion. Right. And in some ways, given the trends that we were talking about and given the scale and the scope of the challenges of what Africa's urban transition represents, um, this is probably some of the most important um, political work that we could be doing today.